Peggy Shepard. Peggy Shepard has successfully combined grassroots organizing, uh, environmental advocacy, and environmental health research to become one of the most highly respected environmental advocates in the country today. She has been a pioneer for advancing the perspective of environmental justice in urban communities to ensure that the entitlement of clean air, water, uh, and soil extends to all people in all communities. A leader within the New York, New York City and the National Environmental Justice Movement, she is co-founder and executive director of WE Act for Environmental Justice, based in West Harlem, which has a 24-year history of affecting environmental and environmental uh, health policy and practice locally and nationally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to your comments and the distinguished committee members. The challenge I have been offered and the challenge that the DNC must embrace is that all residents should have access to clean water, clean air, equal environmental enforcement and protection, and equitable distribution of benefits, burdens, and resources. The reality is that many are sick and dying from disproportionate environmental exposure to pollution, toxins, and policies that have scarred the health and landscapes and indigenous areas of America. We know that place matters, that your zip code or tribal status often determines your health status and the range of environmental hazards and conditions that characterize these communities. For example, Cancer Alley is a 100-mile stretch of land between Baton Rouge and New Orleans that has taken over plantation lands with seven oil refineries and 175 heavy industrial plants. Small African-American communities of 300 and 400 people are sandwiched between these industrial plantations with no evacuation routes. In New York City, public housing is home to over 600,000 people of color and low income living in shameful conditions of mold, pest, and housing deterioration, which is causing chronic disease. In Tillery, North Carolina, black farmers share a fence line with confined animal feed operations where hog manure contaminates residents' groundwater. And don't go outside your home because you might be sprayed with the manure as you go to your car. Farm workers in the Central Valley of California and their children are working in fields sprayed with chloropyrifos, which has been banned by the EPA for residential use, but is still allowed to be used in farming, where the most vulnerable pregnant women and children are working amid the spraying. And today, climate change is our great challenge. Cap and trade systems are opposed by environmental justice organizations nationally for two reasons. They do not reduce the co-pollutants, which trigger asthma and harm the public health. And secondly, cap and trade systems can facilitate an outcome of some plants buying credits rather than reducing their emissions, which results in EJ communities not reaping the benefit of reduced emissions. The next administration should really advance an intersectoral, interdisciplinary approach. We cannot have sustainable communities, a sustainable America, without our transportation, open space, health systems, environmental enforcement in sync. We need to re-envision our energy future to advance energy investment, investment and infrastructure that keeps housings and homes affordable so low-income residents don't lose their homes or landlords do not abandon the maintenance of multifamily buildings. We need to launch a federal Healthy Homes Initiative to work with local governments and community-based organizations to eradicate mold and truly get lead out of homes and drinking water so there are no more Flint disasters. In conclusion, underserved communities need an advocate at the White House who is knowledgeable and concerned about these issues, not simply about public engagement, but about creating change. And we need a Council on Environmental Quality that is empowered or restructured to provide coordination and outreach that is effective, informed, and helps to develop the changes we need. So I thank you, and we are submitting longer recommendations today as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congresswoman Lee, 
Thank you very much. It's so important um, that you're here today with your testimony. Thank you very much. Let me uh, mention, first of all, I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. Uh, in NPR, and, uh, some of you may have heard this story several years ago about the smelters in El Paso. Uh, my contemporaries, uh, the majority of them uh, passed away or uh, got, uh, uh, they got lung disease, uh, multiple sclerosis. My sister has multiple sclerosis. Several of our classmates with MS cancer, all kinds of uh, diseases which uh, led to premature deaths or disabilities. And we know that it was the smelters in El Paso where we lived that somehow uh, was part of the uh, problem. And that's what happened to my contemporaries. So I know this issue very well, so thank you very much. And wanted to ask you now, here we are in 2016, still with lead and water, toxic dump sites in low-income communities. In my community, we're talking now about uh, transporting lead through the black and Latino communities, uh, not lead, excuse me, coal through the black and Latino communities. And I'm wondering if you've had a chance to look at the, uh, the environmental and health impacts of coal. And then secondly, with these environmental injustice decisions that are being made, I mean, these are decisions that lead to environmental justice. Have you looked at civil rights violations around these decisions, and, and do these decisions come under the Civil Rights Act, or could they? Absolutely. There's a Title VI um, an, uh, element of the Civil Rights Act, and it says that if states um, that receive federal funding discriminate that funds, federal funds can be taken from them. However, there's been a backlog of Title VI cases at the EPA for over 20 years, many of them dismissed out of hand. Um, the Title VI uh, area is, is one that needs to be strengthened, and EPA needs to be given the mandate to ensure that these cases are adequately reviewed. And what about coal? Have you studied that Certainly at all? Certainly, we know that burning of coal um, exacerbates asthma and respiratory disease. In New York City, we had uh, an Environmental Bond Act some years ago that actually transformed over 400 public schools that were still using coal-fired furnaces with our children having uh, the asthma uh, epidemic that we have throughout New York City. We also know that coal slurry uh, in Appalachia has contaminated groundwater and waterways um, terribly there. So the impact on Appalachia has been very significant. Mr. Kevin. Uh, thank you so much, not just for your testimony, but for a real lifetime of work. Um, one of the things that worries me sometimes is that when people hear about something like Flint, they get all upset and alarmed, as they should be. But imagine that it's just some kind of one-off anomaly that just, could you talk a little bit about how we should really think about what happened in Flint in a national context? Certainly, um, I think the environmental justice movement believes that it is a prime example of environmental racism. We believe that if this had happened in Ann Arbor, um, this would not have occurred. They would not have switched to um, a contaminated water supply. We also believe that people of color who complain about these issues are not given the, uh, the review and attention that they should be. Uh, we know that the EPA uh, in that region, and, and let me say that the EPA regional directors um, that whole EPA region uh, administrators need to be restructured because they are not accountable to outcomes and they do not seem to be accountable to the uh, administrator in Washington. Uh, but we know that the EPA had, had information that they did not act on. So again, when people of color have these complaints, they are not taken seriously. And until um, a pediatrician came in and did some of the research and began to raise this issue, nothing was done. But the other issue is that we now know that there are at least 19 other cities in this country that have levels of lead in the water uh, that approach Flint or are higher. 
So these issues have been going on for many of years, and because these cities are not making the investment, or because the federal government is, is not giving the uh, investment and funding that some of these um, cities that are you know, have financial issues, um, because of that, they are not taking care of these issues. So water quality is very key. Ms. Parker. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your testimony. Um, how can we bring back environmental justice to tribal nations? Um, because we have people of color in, in different areas, rural areas and so forth, but we have tribal nations that have, they have a uh, whole separate set of laws, uh, uh, sovereign nations, government to government, but often we see a lot of the uh, pollutants and, and big oil and coal companies coming onto reservation lands because they uh, often there's uh, lack of authority or, or law that protects tribal nations. Uh, what have you found in your studies and what can you recommend to our platform committee? Well, I know that the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council to the EPA has had strong indigenous representation and has had uh, a separate indigenous working group. And through that uh, body, we have been able to affect some of the issues on tribal lands but we really need strong, um, strong voices in Congress because there are leaders and tribal leaders who have a certain authority that um, the federal government cannot contravene. So there are those kinds of issues, but there is a lot of strong advocacy on tribes. There's the Indigenous Environmental Network out of Bemidji, uh, Minnesota that has been taking on these issues, uh, I think, in a very effective way. But we need strong congressional support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I take your point about the environmental racism in the, in the case of Flint. Um, it underscored by reference to the fact that the emergency manager who made these decisions in Flint imposed by the state was one of eight emergency managers yeah. across Michigan, which somehow coincidentally have been imposed on the cities and the boards of education that are majority black population. No coincidence there. But I also heard you reference the, uh, the financial dimension of, of what we learned in Flint. Would you, would you concur that in addition to the racial dimension of it, there's also the austerity economic policy that is at the root of the, uh, the short-sighted decisions that were made in Flint, the systematic uh, over a period of years, uh, depletion of state aid to, 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 to cities, not just Flint, but other cities in Michigan, uh, played a role in straightjacketing the, uh, the options available, and then they made this terrible, uh, terrible decision to save a few bucks by diverting from, uh, from the previous water supply that, that has caused this calamity that, that's going to last for, for years and years and years. The kids of Flint who are growing up are going to grow up with all that land. But that the, the fiscal decisions are also crucial here, that we need to reinvest in, in the infrastructure of our, of our cities. Absolutely. Um, we certainly know that our infrastructure is failing throughout the country. and. I, I'm hoping that the DNC and the next administration will make that investment in our infrastructure. These emergency managers in throughout Michigan um, have only been, for the most part, um, put into cities that are primarily um, African American or people of color. Austerity measures seem to fall heavily on communities of color as well. And so democracy has literally been snatched from, uh, from the people in these cities uh, with no review and no recourse. So austerity measures, uh, the financial investment uh, by the federal government is very, very crucial uh, to maintaining environmental quality. Before you leave, let me just uh, say this. You know, as I was listening to you, I, I just can't let you go without um, saying this. See, you know, when, when I grew up in a very, in a very poor neighborhood, and all my six brothers and sisters had asthma. Um, people died early from cancer. Um, I, I mean, I can name all kinds of environmental things that was happening, but we didn't even, we thought it was normal. Um, and so I think the things that you're doing it makes people aware that that's not normal. And a lot of people don't realize that there's some folks who are living in situations that um, they should not. 
and uh, and Barbara Lee talks about poverty. I mean, if you want to talk about poverty, if somebody's sick all the time, it's kind of hard to have uh, to move forward. But uh, I wanted to, to thank you for your advocacy. But the other thing I wanted to ask you was, in you know, a president and the Congress hopefully will do things. But I was just wondering how much of this involves educating people so that they know that you know things can be better. And it's, it's absolutely the way grassroots uh, education and training so that our residents who live in your districts uh, can come in and talk to you about these issues, can brief you and your staff about these issues is crucial. Um, we can't have important mobilization without an informed uh, informed residents. I would also say that we now know that asthma is not normal and more investment to the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences has been crucial. The funding to the Children's Environmental Health Centers around this country has produced incredible research that has looked at the impact of air quality on children intergenerationally and on pregnant women, on vulnerable populations, and has looked at the impact of air quality on asthma and heart disease. So again, we now have the research. We really know what the issues are, and now we need the political will to transform um, our health. Thank you very much. Thank you.